This series that we're about to get into, I've been studying for over a year. Actually, it's longer than that, but, but I've been preparing because some things have been concerning to me. So why are we about to do this series? Well, the first reason is because Christians, if I'm talking to the Christian community that are here, need to be founded in the things that they believe. They need to know what they believe and why they believe it and understand the evidence that it's based on. See, there's a false understanding in culture today that thinks that faith is blind. That, you know, what we believe is really not. But no, Christianity is overwhelmingly the, uh, founded on evidence. And we're going to look through some of those aspects of it. It's important. And why is it important? Because look at this scripture. Peter wrote to the first century followers of Jesus, and it's just as valid today. He said, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that they have. But do this with gentleness and respect. One of these days, i got to give a whole series just to that last aspect with gentleness and respect. Because one of the reasons that Christians sometimes are, 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 are considered irrelevant in society is the way they have addressed things. Okay? But we need to be ready to give an answer. See, we need to know what we believe. We need to understand the hope that we have. But more importantly, to the world around us, to the people that we encounter, what we believe provides hope. And hope is not a wishful thought, oh, I just hope so. No, hope biblically, the word hope in Greek means a confident expectation of a favorable future. The reality of, you, it is based on evidence, it is based on realizations. And so we need to know that end of it. But there's a second reason why this series is very critical to me, near and dear to my heart. And that's because of a trend that has been happening in America, actually in the West, for a number of years now. What's been called and what's been documented, I've read so many different books, a lot of good books I can recommend through this if you want to know more about it, but what's called the rise of the nuns. Nuns was a, was a category researchers came up with for this. People who were checking out on, on, on uh, faith. And so the rise of the nuns are people that said, you know what, don't know, don't care. Even though they were raised potentially in faith, I've read so many through the course of these and over the years I've read so many de deconversion stories people who were once a part of it. And the overwhelming stories are from Christianity, people who have, who have deconverted out of Christianity, okay, and have left that and just kind of, they're in this, this no man's zone. They're just, you know, don't know, don't care, don't, don't have any relevance upon my life. And a lot of this began, it's not all, but it began something that may be historical. Let me catch you up on something. When 9-11 occurred, okay, Sam, uh, Sam, uh, uh, Sam Harris wrote this book, The End of Faith. Okay. Now, when he began to pen this, it is a scathing uh, critique on all religion. He went to 12 publishers. 12 publishers turned him down because they figured in the light of it, because when 9-11 occurred, I was here. The, this place was packed after. The, day, the Sunday after 9-11, like churches all across the United States were packed with people for a few weeks, and then everything went back to normal. And so 12 publishers turned them down because they figured there was no appetite for a critique, especially upon Christianity, okay? But on the 13th publisher, when they published this work, it spent 37 weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list, okay? Now, the responses that he got from Christians, which is sometimes embarrassing, because Christians wrote him some really nasty stuff that I wonder do they really are followers of Jesus, okay? But he wrote something in response to all the, the mail that he got from Christians, about what he had said. And he wrote this book called A Letter to the Christian Nation, Letter to a Christian Nation, which is his critique on Christianity, okay? And the reality of it is what happened, and then, you know, Richard Dawkins wrote this book, and I've said, you know, what's fascinating to me, Richard Dawkins is a brilliant biologist, but the theology in this book is horrible. When I was reading through this, I was like, and you're like, you read this stuff, Pastor Khan? Well, I don't have any problem knowing what other people think. And the reality of it is, is dude, if you believe God was that way, I wouldn't believe either. But you don't have, because it's like a kidney garden view of theology. As much as me trying to talk about biology with him, he's brilliant. He's, he's far brighter than I am, okay? But the truth is, this is a horrible testament. But the problem is that most Christians don't know what they believe. They're not able to give an answer for the hope. In fact, that, that's where the problem lies in so many that is. So that's a part of my passion because here's the trend in the millennials today. Somewhere near 40% of millennials identify themselves as nuns. Now, you got to spell it correctly. I was raised Roman Catholic. So it's a, and I think the person 
that summarizes this dilemma the most. I have this book at home, and I read this. this Karen Armstrong, I believe, sums it up the best. Karen is brilliant. She's written many books. I have a number of them here, but she's written many books. And why I think she sums it up the best, I mean, she's, she's done TED Talks and all the rest. Karen Armstrong said this in The Case for Christ. Here's the quote. She says, many of us have been left stranded with an incoherent concept of God. We learned about God about the same time we were told about Santa Claus. But while our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomena evolved and matured, our theology remained somewhat infantile. Okay? She went on to say, Not surprisingly, when we attained intellectual maturity, many of us rejected the God we had inherited and denied that he even existed. See, Karen Armstrong, I believe, sums it up because she's a double nun. She was once a Catholic nun who deconverted from Christianity and became a N-O-N-E, a nun. Okay? And so here it is. She says that many times what happens is that people learn about God when they're kids, but they try to take their childhood faith into adulthood, and it can't stand against the rigors of adulthood. It's kind of like this. You ask the question, where do babies come from? Right? Where do babies come from? Well, when you're answering the question, doesn't it depend on who's asking? If a five-year-old asks, you might point to mommy's tummy and say, there, and that might be sufficient, correct? But a 15-year-old asks, you don't answer the question the same. If a, if a pre-med student who's studying medicine on that level asks, you would answer it differently. And if a research scientist who is a gynecologist, you know, obstetrician researcher, okay, you would answer it differently, would you not? And the problem is too often that many Christians have an immature, childish, mommy's tummy view of God that cannot withstand the rigors of the adult world and can't provide hope to the people who are asking questions. So that's why this series, I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking caps. I'm going to stretch you in ways because we're not going to deal with, where this is not, over this series, this isn't uh, elementary school. We're going to go a little deeper, and I believe all of you can handle it, okay? I've tried to make it as simple as possible, gone through a lot, but we're going to challenge you because why? We need to grow. We need to mature. The Bible actually encourages us that faith begins one way but must grow. We should go from faith to faith. We must grow. In fact, look at this. If you're taking notes with me, listen. We enter God's kingdom as, as a child. Jesus said unless you be converted and become as a child, right? Because there's an innocence in childhood. You don't have all these predeterminations that you're resistant to the truth, right? But you don't really, it's a, we enter God's kingdom as a child, but our faith must grow up. We're required to grow up. So this is a grown-up thing. So the series is called Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. What I'm going to use is an American jurisprudence uh, uh, platform on this end because as every person in the United States on our justice system is entitled to a fair trial. Okay, by a jury of their peers. And so what happens is evidence is provided and juries have to sort through evidence and come to conclusions. They develop a verdict based on what they hear, correct? And what I want to do with this series is just provide evidence for all of you as rational, uh, intelligent people to look at the actual evidence and make a determination for yourself. Does anybody remember the O.J. Simpson trial? Many, many years ago, O.J. Simpson was uh, uh, um, accused of killing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her boyfriend, Ronald Goldman, okay? Now, that, that, that trial, you know, fascinated. It had the attention of the entire nation, okay? It was hard for me. As a, when I was watching that, I mean, O.J. Simpson was one of my heroes growing up. I mean, it was the juice. Even though I wasn't a Buffalo Bills fan, he was brilliant in his skills, okay? He was also the Hertz rent-a-car dude, okay? I'm dating myself, okay? And he was, a, he was a movie star. So it was hard for me to think that he could have committed such heinous crimes. But when the trial began, the evidence seemed to be substantial. I mean, his blood was found at the scene. In fact, Nicole Brown Simpson, Ronald Goldman, and O.J.'s blood was found in his Bronco, okay? There was the situation of a glove that was found, the bloody glove that was at the scene, which was a kind of glove that O.J. wore for four or five years prior to that. There was a matching one in his, in his apartment, okay? But 
then we had this bloody footprint that was not only at the scene, it was in the Bronco, and it was a size 12 shoe, Bruno Mali shoes, which was so limited, there was only 299 pairs created, okay? And then you had this craziness where the whole nation watched this chase of a white Bronco going through the city of Los Angeles and the whole police department, helicopters, news media, and everybody watching this bizarre scene, right? So it looked like it was substantial, but here's the point. Was O.J. OJ guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, a jury of his peers found him not guilty, right? Now, people have opinions, people have views, and all the rest of that. Now, you would, some people have trouble, why was he not in all? But you know what? Our worldviews really affect and implement how we look at things. And with this nation's horrible record of racism, there was many that thought plausible that maybe the police could be capable of doing something like that. And here's the point. What I'm asking you all to do is have an open mind and look at evidence for yourself. Because you know what? Like in the case of O.J. Simpson or like in any other jury trial, what they do is they sort through evidence and they come up with what? Beliefs. Because, you know, too often people say faith is blind. That could not be any more true. The word believe in the Greek language is the word pisteo. And the word pisteo means to be persuaded. How do they persuade people in, an, in, in a trial? They give testimony. They provide evidence. And so the predominant way we as human beings are persuaded are things that we hear, right? And the word faith, which comes out of the word persuado, is the word pistis. And it literally means fully persuaded. A firm conviction of something believed, okay? And so in essence, faith is not blind. You can look at the evidence and choose for yourself. That's what God has given each of us the freedom to understand. And so we're going to look at it in that way because here's the point. Richard Dawkins says this. Richard Dawkins, the great biologist, said this. He said, faith is the greatest cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. See, that's where I, I, I totally disagree with, 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 with Richard. But maybe he's talked to a bunch of people who believe just because they believe. Okay. But faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. Yeah, no wonder he hasn't put his faith in Christ. But you see, here's the point, okay? If you're taking notes with me, you and I need to recognize this, that we are instructed in Scripture to worship God with our mind. Jesus said these words, Matthew 22. Jesus said this. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart. See, Jesus asked the question, what's most important to God? And all Jews knew and understood this. This was a part of Judaism, okay? It was at the foundation, at the core of it. To love God with all your heart, with all your what? Your soul. And with all of your what? Your mind. That's why my, one of my friends, a uh, rabbi that I studied with, he told me that the epitome of worship in the Jewish culture is the study of scriptures. To know God for yourself personally. Therefore, you have to engage your mind. And that's what I'm asking you in this series. To not just let it touch your emotions, but to use your mind. To worship God with your mind. But again, Richard Dawkins says this. He says this. He says, one of the truly bad effects of religion is that it teaches us that it's a virtue to be satisfied without, with not understanding. And a lot of people are just lazy. Okay? They have, you know, a, a, a ma, they have a mommy tummy's view of God, okay, just because they don't want to look at it for themselves, okay? And so in essence, here's the tension, and that's what I want to get to today. Here's the tension that exists in our culture, okay? Nope, nope, the other one, sorry. The source of tension in our modern day, this is the source of tension. Has science replaced the Bible as the ultimate source of truth? And you see... Whether you're a parent, you're a grandparent, you need to care about this. Because this is the stuff your kids are exposed to. You know, all you have to do is tap on the internet. You can watch. I've been watching these debates. I've been going through this stuff. I've been watching this stuff for years, okay? And that's what bothers me at times is that Christians don't follow the aspect. They don't actually, sometimes they don't follow the teachings of Jesus, which gets us in huge trouble to begin with. Because if we only just followed the teachings of Jesus, we wouldn't have the infamous reputation we had, Okay? We're not supposed to be mean. We're, not spo we're supposed to love our enemies. Okay, but here's the point. Listen, listen. Christians need to know how to give an answer. 
And we have to stop just being scared. And somehow this tension between science and religion is a false tension. It doesn't need to be there. But you have to understand the, the, game, the game plan, the rules. Because a lot of the scientists, when I've been studying, when I've been listening, when I've been reading, I've been going through all this, most scientists are reductionists. What do I mean by that? Is that they believe that there's only the material world. So they believe in the laws of physics, the laws in biology, and the laws in chemistry. And if that's true, if that's all there is, then you don't have a mind. Because scientists say it's determinism. Okay? Everything is fate. I mean, you, do, you can't. And, and, you know, even the brilliant Stephen Hawking, as a determinist, says, you know what's funny about human nature? Most determinists that say, you know, you can't do anything to determine your future still look both ways when you cross the street. And I would say to them, most of them that are atheists on that front don't really believe what they believe because it's pointless to debate. Because if everybody was just going to believe what they believe, then why are we having this discussion? Because you don't have a mind. You don't have a conscience. That's what the new atheists have brought to pass. Those are the ones, when 9-11 happened, all these people became like rock stars. They're on college campuses. People watch their YouTube stuff. And the point is that Christians often were not able to give truly plausible and credible uh, 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 explanations, rationalities, and reasons why they believe what they believe. But you see, to a reductionist, to a materialist, the point is this, many of the things that you provide as evidence, they say is inadmissible because it's irrelevant. Because the whole idea of God, see, to them that are that way, that are a reductionist in that way, to look for God in creation is as foolish as looking for a painter in his painting. Okay, God is, God is not bound by time, space, or matter because he created it all. He transcends it all. So to try to limit God to time, space, and matter is foolish. It's absolutely beyond. But you see, to go there, you can't put God in a test tube. Science has its limits. And one of the things that scientists have trouble admitting to, because we're going to have intelligent discussions, science has been wrong. Now, we all love, Christians can be horrible about this. Christians can be big hypocrites, okay? And we've gotten ourselves in trouble. We haven't handled science well over the years. You look at people like Gal Galileo. You look at Copernicus. You can look at people like that. And the scare, the church was almost fearful. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Nothing, let me help you with this, nothing scientifically has ever proved what the scriptures say as not to be true. But Christians get themselves in trouble all the time because number one, the Bible is not a science book. So stop trying to treat it as one. Okay? Number two, we feel the need to argue about things that we don't need to. The Bible didn't say that, so why are you trying to argue that? And they become a house of cards. Okay? But nothing scientifically has ever been. But, but see, if you're a reductionist, you're a, because listen, they'll tell you, well, well, this is based on logic and reason. But no, 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 no. Atheism, look at this. Atheism is not just deciding not to believe in God. And why am I talking about this? Because when people walk away from one thing, whether they understand it or not, they're walking towards something else. There's no, there, and a lot of people feel stuck in the middle. One of the core, one of the reasons for this series, because some people, maybe in this congregation, you have doubts, but you don't know a safe place to talk to them about. So we're going to go through it all. I want to provide you the evidence and opportunities that there's a safe place to deal with it. Okay? But here, atheism is not just deciding not to believe in God. Atheism is a complex belief system that leads to some unsettling conclusions. Why? Because if you're an atheist, I read Sam Harris's book, okay, Free Will. Free Will is an entire illusion in their world. Because if the world is governed by the laws of physics and you never have a choice that it's determinism, then it's just an illusion. It leads to some unsettling, but unsettling doesn't mean not true. The point is, Christians have felt like the deer on the head, like we're the backed up, and we need to know what we believe and why we believe it, and not be always just on the defense, okay? So, what we need to understand about God, listen, God wrote two books, if you're taking notes, God wrote two books to learn about him, the Bible and nature. Why do I say that? Romans 1 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So God said, in nature, you can learn about him. 
okay? In fact, look at what David wrote in Psalm 19. David wrote this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Verse 2. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. But look at verse 3. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. But look at verse 4. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In fact, when you look at the universe, okay, look at what you learn. I put this together. Look at what you learn from the book of nature. These are the things that you learn from the book of Evidence from the book of nature. Number one, the universe had a beginning. Do you know that up until the 1960s, any scientist who held the view that the universe had a beginning would have been disbarred and, 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 and uh, thrown out of the scientific community and lost their, their, their position in any college in America. Okay? Because why? All the way from Aristotle forward, they believed that the, the universe had to be eternal because the laws of physics, the laws of biology and chemistry, you know, there's no beginning point. They, 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 they just exist. So the universe must be universal. But a guy named Hubble came along and began to look at the, the heavens and started to see, okay, the, co the background cause, uh, 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 um, background, uh, um, excuse me, radiation, background cosmic radiation, okay, which was the, what became known when he first brought out his theory, he was actually ridiculed in the scientific community and they called it, oh, the Big Bang. But then that took hold. Now every scientist believe in the Big Bang because what they said was that there was this dense matter, okay? And here's the interesting part. Energy. What did the energy come from? A photon. If you know anything about science, what is a photon? It is a light particle. Oh, let there be what? This is where Christians, it, listen. And it, when it exploded, when it began to unfurl the universe, okay? It had a beginning. Well, science then proved that the Bible said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, that was ridicule for years. See, this, the Bible is wrong right from the very first sentence. But we discovered in science that the universe had a beginning. And based on the law of cause, this is one of the things that when you deal with materialists, here's the point of science, the law of causality. Everything, you know, science is a search for causes. Okay? But if you only, there's two kinds of causes. There's natural causes and there are intelligent causes. Let me give you an example of that. Okay? You look at the Grand Canyon and you look at Mount Rushmore. Now, both of these are carved out rocks, right? Now, the Grand Canyon is the result of natural causes. But how many of you believe that Mount Rushmore just happened because the waters went by and made those faces on it? No, that's called intelligent causes. But when you get into a scientist that's not open to the idea of intelligent causes, okay, then it shuts down the conversation. They're only looking for a natural cause. And so look at this. The second reality, the fine-tuning of the universe. Because, see, this part of science is what we call forensic science. It's like when you go to court, okay, nobody generally was at the scene of the crime. Maybe eyewitnesses were there or whatever, but listen. You use forensic evidence. You look, for, you look for it by origin, what happened, and you, you let the clues lead you. So when you look at these, the beginning of the universe, you look at the fine-tuning of the universe. What do we mean by that? Just this alone, this is fascinating. But energy of the Big Bang, okay, to cause the universe to unfurl and for the ability to life to be able to form on this planet in the midst of it, if the energy of the Big Bang was off because they say it was, if it was just off by 10 to the 120th power. Now, if you're not used to mathematical configurations, that's 10 with 120 zeros after it. That is a big number. If it was off by just that much, it would have been impossible for life to form. Here's this. Look at this. There are 15 constants in the universe, things like the boiling point of water, gravity, the speed of, the speed of light, if any one of those, just one of them, was off by, by 0. .00001, none of them would have been able to work. Okay? It's just, look at this. The, 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 the gravity, look at the, uh, the moon, the next, the next point down. Gravity of the moon and the exact distance of the earth from the sun. 
The fact is where they're placed. We live in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Okay? It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. Because if our planet was just slightly more towards the sun, everybody would burn up. If we were just slightly away from it, everybody would freeze. But the fact that, have, that, the, that, the, that the moon is in the exact position causing the, the, the earth to access to tilt just slightly provides the opportunity for life to be able to be formed. You're telling me this is a cosmic accident and that's an intelligent discussion to this whole thing? See, the fact is, and look at the next one, the complexity, biological complexities of life. When, when Charles Darwin said, oh, you know, complex life came from simple life, well, simple by whose terms? The complexity of what they call simple life is complex and alone in it. And the fact is, nobody in science has ever said, where did life come from? Charles uh, 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 Darwin tried to say how species evolved, but there is no answer. You see, scientifically, there's no answer. Where did life start? One of, the, one of the guys I read after, brilliant book, if you have a problem, Francis Collins, who used to be an atheist, he's the head of the, he was the head of the Human Genome Project, mapped the human gene, DNA, okay? Used to be an atheist, now is an avid believer, scientist, brilliant, head of the Institutes of Health in America, okay? He wrote a book called The Language of God. Because how do you go from lifeless matter to the digital elegance of DNA? It would have been easier for a monkey to sit at a keyboard and just bang on it and type out war and peace than to get the digital elegance, that DNA, that gives the, the, the fine-tuning of all that is created to be created. Okay? Look at the next one. Okay? The genetic code, DNA, I already covered that, but look at the next after that. See, God makes doing science possible. What scientists don't admit much today is that it was Christians that started modern science. Why? Because Christians believe that God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he what? Rested, which mean that? Meant that God's no longer creating. Okay, the universe isn't changing, which means that it's stable, it's predictable, it's consistent. Therefore, you can do science to discover how God did what he did. You see, the early scientists were Christians. They were discovered, they were looking at the world that God had made, and they became in awe of the way God did what he did, okay? And so in essence, what you and I need to see, here's the, here's the point, there's this unnecessary tension. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to a whiteboard so you all follow me on this one. There's this unnecessary tension because when you look at science, one of the very first things that can be confusing is people don't understand the difference in science. There's two branches of science. There's operation science, and there is origin science. Okay, what's the difference? Operation science is lab science. That's where you, let, where you test things and come to conclusions. Okay, medicines and other things, because again, we as Christians, we want advances in science. We, we love technology. We love medicine. We love the things that it's provided, okay? But we need to understand the difference, okay? Because origin science is forensic science. Forensic science follows the clues to make deductions because nobody was there. So you look at the evidence, you begin to examine. And the problem is this in current society. When I've read a lot of these books about the nuns and the way people are, or read deconversion stories, out of all the deconversion stories I read, I have never found anybody whose reason for deconverting from Christianity had anything to do with Christianity. Okay? People have stories, they have things and all, but listen, what happens today, people are bowled away because there are very brilliant people. Sam Harris is brilliant, okay? J Richard Dawkins are brilliant. But they need to understand their lane, okay? Because for them to talk about the, I've heard every one of them talk about theology, and I'm like, well, that's weird. I don't believe that. That's not biblical, okay? That's an elementary viewpoint, okay? So here's the point. What happens is many times guys who have uh, academia in this area attempt to speak into this area, and they're wrong. But look at this, look at this, look at this. This is so fascinating to me. Richard, I mean, excuse me. No, go back to the quote, guys. Uh, sorry, Jackie, go back to the quote. This Stephen Hawking, the brilliant Stephen Hawking, so, you know, once in a generation mind. Stephen Hawking said this, the odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. 
I think there are clearly religious implications. He goes on to say this. It would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun if it, just the way, except as the act of God who intended to create it, beings like us. But you see, he's decided to search for another reason because he's a materialist. He doesn't believe that God's even an option. Now look at this. Richard Dawkins, the one who wrote The God Delusion, he wrote this. Biology. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. See, what you need to understand, the problem is not science. It's scientists. Because science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. It's how you frame it, and it's what you conclude out of it. It's only Richard Dawkins that says that it's the appearance of complexity that had a purpose and meaning. But it can't be. Why? Because here's the problem. You have two worldviews, okay? There are two worldviews. And this is where the tension has been, okay? Two worldviews. There is science and there is religion, okay? And so you have this, okay? A rectangle and a circle, all right? And in a 2D world, okay, 2D meaning a rectangle on this board, this is a two-dimensional part, you have height, right? And you have width, that's two-dimensional, correct? Now, if you were to add a third dimension, take this pen I'm holding. If I were to look at it this way, it looks like a rectangle. If I were to turn it this way, it looks like a circle. And so you ask the question, is it a rectangle or is it a circle? Yep. <laughs> and here's the problem. See, is the more I study, Christians don't need to be scared. I believe religion and science form a duality. That they're not against one another. They actually work consistently. But we haven't understood well enough. We get ourselves in trouble because, here, let me choose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make something complex really simple. And if you want a, a more concise or better explanation to what I'm about to show you, Francis Schroeder's book, The Science of God, is fascinating. Okay, and this, But here's the point. The age of the universe. Okay? Now, did creation take six days or 14 billion years? Question. How many people in this building believe that creation took six days? Okay. You're a lot more braver than the first service, okay? Okay. And how many believe it took 14 billion years? Okay. All right, here's the point. What you have to discover, and I'm going to show you this. You can look this up on, on YouTube. You can go on YouTube. I mean, you can go on, um, on, on Google and look this up. WMAP. This is from NASA, okay? And this is the cone of what we know as the universe, okay? The starting point where, where, where the Big Bang occurred, where the quantum fluctuations occurred from, Okay? and the expanse of the universe here. And then it expanded, okay? And there's the stretching of the universe. So there are three, there are factors that you need to understand to, to get to a true answer here. Here are the factors. And this is where Christians got in trouble years ago because why did they give Galileo a hard problem? Because they thought that the universe circled around the earth, like we were the center of everything. That's just too high an opinion of yourself. Last time I checked, it's all about God, not about us. Okay? But that was crazy to, to argue that end. And Galileo was right. Copernicus was right. There was things that we don't, you know. And here's one of the things. Christians get themselves in trouble for really dumb things. Because you ask the question, it's undeniable. There's certain undeniable scientific fact. Okay? And so people ask the question, where do dinosaurs come from? And you know, I have heard the absurdity of Christians. And some of them scientists have tried to argue that dinosaurs were on the ark. That is bizarre. <laughs> but because we've not been willing to use our minds, we feel it's important to argue our position without looking at the facts. So the very first factor is this, okay? Where it, where it began, okay? Second factor, okay, is... Let me get my cheat sheet. 
okay, is the rate of expansion. See, science has proven what the rate of expansion of the universe is. The, earth, the, the stretching of the, of the universe is by one trillion. It's stretching by a trillion. Now, why is that important? I'll get into it. Because the third aspect, okay, is relativity. Now, some people who think that relativity is still just a theory are not up on the scientific community. Einstein's position that E equals mc squared has been proven, the speed of light. And what we've learned about light is fascinating because light is both a particle and a wave, and that there are certain factors that can cause time to slow down or to speed up. Okay, gravity. The intensity of gravity will slow time down. Okay, or speed. The faster something goes, the slower time happens. So the questions then become, where did it begin? Well, if it began here, the problem is humankind is looking this way. But God who began it is looking this way. So when you look at this and you realize, okay, that when you look at the expansion of the universe from its very origin and beginning, when you're asking the question, the age, is it 14 billion years or is it six days, it depends where you're looking at it from. Anybody ever used binoculars before? I'll try to illustrate this for you. See, you look through the small end and what it happens? Everything gets bigger, right? You look through the other end, everybody gets tiny. Okay, inch high private eye all over the place, okay? Right? Because it's all a matter of perspective. Listen, follow me. You can, you can see that. Listen, listen, listen. Because of the stretching factor, there's what science has proven is time dilation. Okay? So in essence, if you're looking at the earth clock, the earth is 14, or excuse me, the universe, I'm sorry, is 14 billion years old. If you're looking at the Bible's clock from where God is, it's literal six days. And there's a mathematical formula to prove it. So is it a rectangle or is it a circle? Yep. See, we've not been willing to open our minds and embrace the fact because nothing that science has shown has proven. But you see, when Christians have felt like, man, i got to defend, it's six days. And guess what, guys? It can't be. How do we count a day? By one rotation around the sun, correct? If you're honest and you read Genesis 1, the sun and the moon was not created until day 4. It can't be. See, we've argued things that the Bible doesn't say. God Almighty is looking at it this way. And from his point of view, it's a literal six days. From man's point of view, looking back this way, it's 14 billion years. No need for an argument. So look at me. Look at me. If you're taking notes today, so important. Science and the Bible are not just compatible, but interdependent. They each have their lane. You see, science has limits. Okay? It's like, let me give you a simple little shade. You know, it's like the scientist and the metal detector. Okay? A metal detector is great for finding metal, correct? But if you're walking on the beach, guess what you'll never discover? Wood, rubber, diamonds, right? But it's fantastic for discovering metal. Science has its limits. Science is not the answer for everything. In fact, science can't handle some of the biggest problems that humanity deal with. Things like injustice. The things like value. You can't put value in a test tube. The value and dignity of human life. See, nobody wants to be treated like their biology. Right? Because there's something inside of human beings. In fact, scientists, they don't have an answer for this one. Why are human beings pre-programmed to believe in an afterlife? I don't care. It's not just in the Western world. Across the planet, human beings are predisposed to believe that. Why? See, science, see the Bible says God has put eternity in human hearts. We know there's more. But we just know sometimes 
you can't use science. Listen to me. Let me use this simple illustration. Science has its limits. It's like somebody bakes a cake. Science can tell you everything about that cake. It can tell you what the ingredients were used, how long was it baked, at what temperature it was baked, the consistency of the frosting, everything associated with it. You know what science can't tell you? Why somebody baked it. <laughs> See, science is fantastic for telling you what and how. But it can never provide you the answers to who and why. That's why you need philosophy. That's why you need things that science... Science can't even... Mathematics can't be proven in a science lab. But we use mathematics all the time. Science is not the end-all, be-all. There is a duality. And the Christians have been as much responsible for this war as the scientists have been. We need to embrace the reality and not be scared that what science finds out is not just like, oh, wow, that's how God did it. Because it's like this. If you were to know everything about your mobile phone, you know, how the glass was formed, how the, how the, how the, and some of you may be that smart, okay? Maybe you're a lot smarter than me, but you know, if you know how the Wi-Fi works, how the microcomputer chips work, if you knew everything about it, it would never lead you to conclude that nobody created it. See, there's almost a fear that's unsubstantiated in the Christian world, and we've allowed our kids and our young adults and people to suffer because of it. We need to be worshiping God with our minds and not be scared. Because science and faith, or science and religion, see, I do not believe, I started reading this years ago, I do not believe what Christopher Hitchkin says. His book, God is, great, God is Not Great, says how religion poisons everything. That's the problem that people have today. And my answer to that is this, religion doesn't poison everything, people poison religion. If the followers of Jesus just lived up to the principles of Jesus, we'd have a whole lot less problems. They wouldn't get the hate mail that they get and the things said about it, okay? You and I have the responsibility, so listen, listen. Just look at the evidence. Next week, tee it up for you. We're going to talk about Exhibit A, the Bible, because I think that a lot of people are very ignorant in the Christian community about the Bible, and we're going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about why the importance of it. Week after that, we're going to talk about God. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about the issue of injustice. And then I'm going to make my... Today was just opening statements. Like in a court of law. So I hope you stay with me for the whole. Because we're going somewhere. Amen? <laughs> Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for us today. Father, give us the courage to truly be people who are not scared to look. People who will know what we believe and why we believe. To worship you with our minds. To not be afraid. To not make the Bible say things that it doesn't say. To not give foolish answers. There's undeniable facts about things. But they're not necessarily what people say they are. Give us the wisdom and the understanding to know the beauty of what you created. Because you wrote two books. You wrote the Bible and you wrote the book of nature. May we as people of God... Not be afraid to look at both and to conclude for ourselves what the facts, what the clues lead to. I pray, almighty God, that you would give us the courage to go through this whole series and stretch our emotions. To not just come to feel good at church, but to exercise our thinking and to know what we believe. I pray that in Jesus' name. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed all across this auditorium here, if you're here today, here's the big problem. Here's what actually, no matter what worldview people come from, we can all probably agree on one thing, that the problem of our world lies with mankind. We can be cruel and mean and difficult to deal with one another. That the problems of our world have been made by us. We've concluded, and there's something inside of us, Father, that we, if we're honest, we're all here in church today, if we're honest, we don't live up to our own expectations. We make promises we don't keep. We're not able to control our world as much as we think we're the masters of our own universe. That, Father God, that there are things that are out of control. And you see, the Bible gives the understanding that what's universal to mankind, that the problem is something in us. See, all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have not lived up to our own expectations. Forget the expectations of anybody else. But here's the good news. That God so loved the world 
that he chose to enter it. That Jesus, the Son of God, took upon himself humanity so we could know God. But more importantly than that, that he could lay his life down and pay the price for every human sin and give the ability to whosoever would believe, whosoever would conclude. See, the gospel seems almost too good to be true. But that's how important you are to the God who created the universe. That he demonstrated his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, that Christ died on the cross. See, the foolishness that people say today is, that, well, if he's God, why didn't he just universally forgive everybody? Why did there have to be a death? See, science can't understand justice. See, when a crime has been perpetrated, somebody has to pay for there to be justice. Because how can you say you're just if you let the criminals responsible go free just because you said it? You see, God is both just and God is merciful. And they came together in the cross. And you couldn't know love either without sacrifice. That God's love became so apparent and so real because he proved it by willingly sacrificing what was necessary to make forgiveness and a restoration possible for every single human being. See, science can't answer that question. It can't alter human behavior, and we can't. But the gospel's good news that God from the inside out, the God who created us to begin with, made us for a plan and a purpose. And we can, we can re-engage and take hold of that purpose when we recognize that God didn't send a judge into the world. He sent a Savior. He didn't come to prove us wrong. He came to help us right where we're at. 